All right, uh, let's get started. So today um, we'll be talking about two slightly separate topics. Um, this will basically be the last lecture that is on sort of general classic ML methods. Starting on Wednesday, we will be talking more about specific kinds of data and the rest of the semester we'll be spending on text images in time series data and a bunch of neural networks. But there's um, two kinds of tasks in unsupervised learning that I wanted to uh, touch upon. And so even though they don't really belong together, I'm gonna to talk about uh, both of these today. These are matrix factorization, in particular non-negative matrix factorization and uh, outlier detection. Before I get started with um, these topics, uh, I published a library today on GitHub called Dabble, and uh, right now it has a lot of st stuff to plot and clean your data, so um, it's very fresh and so very like pre-alpha, but if you want to try it out, it might help you do some more data visualization more easy or do some data cleaning for you more easily. And so if you try it out and have any feedback, please let me know. So basically it does like a bunch of exploratory data analysis with like a single line, which would be helpful. All right, so let's get started with the non-negative matrix factorization. Um, first of all, what is matrix factorization? So matrix factorization means you have um, your data matrix X, which is number of samples times number of input features, and you factorize it into a matrix product, here call it A and B, um, where A is the number of ta uh, samples times some number K, and B is K times um, the input features. So often K here is thought of the latent dimensionality, and so we, this is a way to either extract features from the data or to possibly compress the data. So uh, this matrix A now is a new, what's called, um, latent representation of your data, and B is some sort of transformation that expresses uh, patterns in your data. In uh, the language of scikit-learn, this would be, uh, you take X and you transform it in some way, and the transformation would be A. The way this is actually written down is the other way around, as you can see. It's basically, you assume x can be expressed as a times b, and b are sort of some parameters of the model that you want to estimate, and a is this latent representation. And uh, there's many models that fall into this category. One that we've um, already seen is PCA. So in PCA, we decompose x into some projected data a and the principal components B. So B are, you can think of the principal as the principal components or as the rotation depending on uh, how you exactly define it. And um, so this is one possible way to factorize. Um, what PCA does is it restricts to the components, so the columns in B to be um, orthogonal and it tries to optimize the reconstruction error, so it tries to optimize um, a b minus x and the squared loss of that. And um, this sort of completely defines PCA, but there's many other um, requirements you could make of a and b. And so, yeah, as I said, PCA um, has as uh, requirements components are orthogonal and you minimize the square loss. There's also sparse PCA where um, you want the components to be sparse and orthogonal or possibly you want their latent representation to be sparse, that's also an option. Um, something that's um, been widely used in the past is independent component analysis, ICA. So uh, in PCA you find uh, directions in the data that are um, that have uh, no covariance. In ICA, 
you're trying to find direction of the data that are actually independent. Um, so that's a little bit trickier, but the idea is to find some explanatory variables uh, that explain how the data was generated. In uh, non-negative matrix factorization, the requirements are that both the latent representation and the latent features are non-negative. So both the matrices that are called A and B would be positive. Usually they're um, called W and H, where W are the weights and H is the hidden representation. So again, as with other matrix factorization algorithms, the idea here is to um, get some latent representation that summarizes or extracts information of, uh, from the data and describes this in H, and um, the way it corresponds to the original data is stored in W. The way NMF in particular is uh, computed, um, so the loss function we're optimizing is either um, what's called the Frobenius loss, which is just a squared loss on matrix elements. So here assume that uh, Y is my reconstruction, so Y is um, H, H times W. So this is sort of the, given H and W, I would reconstruct Y, and um, these are the losses that I want to optimize, so I want to find H and W, so either that the Frobenius norm is um, minimized, meaning the product of H and W is close to X in the least square sense. Another commonly used, um, oh, I think I missed an L in cobalt leibner uh, Another commonly used uh, loss is the cobalt leibner divergence. Um, we actually have seen this in Peace Me, possibly last Wednesday, uh, no, last Monday, uh, that was also used this is usually used to measure the distance between two distributions, and it's an asymmetric measure. And I don't want to go like into the full details of this, but there's reasons why people like to use this. But these are both commonly used. Um, probably uh, the least squares is sort of easier to understand why this would be uh, the right thing, or it's more intuitive maybe. And so this is what we want to optimize. And um, so if you can figure out that, uh, you're gonna figure out that this is convex in um, W or H. So if you fix W, it's convex in H. If you fix H, it's convex in W. It's very common for these um, matrix factorization problems that uh, if you fix one, then it's easy to compute the other one, but uh, if you can't compute both at the same time. And so overall, NMF is not convex and there's not, no, um, way to find the global optimum. So usually, um, this is randomly initialized. Either you can initialize this with PCA, sometimes I think people initialize it even with k-means, or um, with random data points. So that it would, yeah. I mean, it would uh, initialize W with random data points. And then you can iteratively update, um, sorry, um, w and B using a gradient descent or something like that. Um, and so here I uh, said it's not convex, so it depends on what, how you initialize what will be the final solution you end up with. Something here that's quite different from um, PCA and from other matrix factorization algorithms is that once you give mm, uh, the weight W, if you give, get a new data set x test, actually um, there's no easy way to compute h and you have to run an optimization algorithm to compute h. In PCA, once you have the principal component, you can just do a matrix multiplication and you get uh, your rotated version of x test, like the projection of principal components. Here in NMF, um, it's quite hard because you need to basically find Given W, you need to find the H that is positive and um, solves the least squares. And this positive is kind of hard to, um, this constraint is harder to implement, and so you need to run uh, some optimization algorithm to find X test. So even though this equation, X equal WH, looks like it is something very linear, the things that you get here is that this is a very nonlinear transformation. 
there's no linear, linear transformation that goes from X test to H. That's like going from X test to H is a, you need to run an optimization procedure. So this is sort of, yeah, in a sense, much more complex, much more nonlinear than what you do with PCA. Right, so um, why did I pick talking about PCA? Uh, NMF. There's so many matrix factorization algorithms, why am I interested in NMF? So one of the things that is interesting about it is you have meaningful signs. I talked about PCA and said the, the sign of the eigenvectors is completely arbitrary. Um, and so that makes PCA directions harder to understand. And NMF, everything is positive. So sort of zero has a meaning and positive has a clear meaning. Um, the weights are positive, which means that combinations are always um, positive linear combinations, which are easier to understand usually. Um, I think I talked also about the cancellation effect in PCA where uh, one component might trade something and then to take another component which will remove that. We'll see this in, an, uh, in a second with um, the MNIST data set on how this plays out. And another interesting aspect is that it can learn over complete representations. Um, what I mean by this is we can get, make k bigger than the number of features. In PCA, the number of components is um, the maximum number of components is the minimum of the number of features and the number of samples. Because that's the maximum number of uh, linear independent directions you can get. Here, you can potentially get um, arbitrary many, well, I guess I think it's, okay, you can penalize this, if you don't penalize this, so that you can only get I guess uh, as many as there are samples, many components, but there's, if you have a big data set, potentially there's many more samples than um, features. And so uh, you can extract features that are, um, or you can extract more features than, than they were originally. Here is an example of applying this to um, the MNIST data set, so this is not the digits data set, the digits is a thing that's in scikit-learn that's um, eight times eight. MNIST is a little bit higher resolution, it's 28 times 28, and there's uh, 70,000 samples, but there are also digits, 100 digits from uh, zero to nine. And so here at the top, um, you can see zero, this picture of zero as explained by PCA. I ordered them by um, the largest number of projections, not by the largest eigenvalues. So there's different, there's sort of different components. I mean, you can actually see these are the same components but in different order. But uh, I put at what are the most important components for each of them. So you can see for both for zero and one, this is actually the first component, it's the most important one. And to get um, a positive value for zero and a negative value for one. So if I would ask you, what does this component mean, then I guess it's probably zero minus, like a positive zero and a negative one, which is already sort of a weird thing. Um, it's like, this is not like a feature that would be like easy to interpret. So this component clearly stands both for zero and one, depending on which sign you pick. Um, then if you look at the other components here, this kind of looks like a three or a nine here, but actually these play very strong roles in trading this zero. And it's, uh, this is what I mean by this cancellation effect. So you, may, you create some parts of the digit and then you, re you remove them again using other components. So all of these components have very global effects that you uh, overlay in some way. Um, Whereas um, here in the NMF, this is what people refer to as like possibly as parts. By having uh, this restriction that all the numbers need to be positive, 
uh, in so this, these numbers are the weights, but all the numbers need to be positive. Sorry, this is not the weights. The pictures are the weights, the numbers are the hidden representation, both of them need to be positive. And so there can be no cancellation, and so whenever I create something, I cannot take it away. And so you get this additive representation, which says the one is like a combination of these parts of the stroke, and the zero is a combination of these, these parts of the stroke. And um, some people might argue that it's easier to interpret. Um, So the downsides of NMNF, the most obvious one is it can only be applied to non-negative data. And um, okay, you can say, oh, well, I can just add a big number to my data and it's going to be non-negative, but that doesn't usually make a lot of sense. You want zero to be meaningful. If you have uh, a meaningful zero in positive data, then you can apply NMF. Um, and I'm going to talk about applications in a second. Interpretability, as sort of as general with machine learning, is a little bit a hit or miss. So one of the big benefits of NMF is that your components are possibly more interpretable, but um, like how interpretable are these? Maybe they're more interpretable than this, but like it's very hard to quantify interpretability, and sometimes you get models that are very non-interpretable. It's a non-convex optimization, so it requires initialization. And um, so, A, it takes a long time to run this compared to like PCA. And also, uh, the results are basically non-deterministic or they depend on the initialization. So if you run it and someone else runs it, if they use a different implementation with different initialization, they will get um, different results. Um, Another downside, or maybe two downsides, is they're not orthogonal, which means you can't really think about projections. I like thinking about projections because they're sort of easy in my mind. Uh, but here, uh, I want to illustrate two things actually with this. So if you have here an F with two, with two components on this positive data set, you'll see that you have um, the two components actually point at the ends of the, the like extremes of the data. And um, so they're not necessarily orthogonal. Um, but also, if you take less components, they will not be a subset of the existing components. And so um, if I run on the same data set NMF with one component, I get something that points as at the mean of the data. So these are completely different, right? So if I run with, the, with two components, I get these two guys. If I run it with one component, I get this guy. And so if I look at these two guys, there's no order in them. There's just, I have two components. There's not like, I have this is the first and the second component. And if I run it with a single component, I get something completely different again. Um, so this also makes the components a little bit harder to interpret. Uh, so if you change the number of components, they may change more or less drastically. One thing you might can see here also that's sort of interesting is that, in a sense, NMF tries to um, get find prototypes. So the reason why it goes to the boundaries here is um, basically everything in this data set, because everything is on this, this diagonal, can be explained as a linear combination of this and this. And so um, with these two vectors, I can get a positive uh, combination of all the points in there. Yeah, so here, different example on uh, MNIST, again, with uh, 20 components. These are all the 20 components at the top. If you do five components, you get the five at the bottom. Um, I didn't show it, it was 10 components. I think it's like, um, it's not entirely the 10 numbers, but it's something close to it. Um, so here, again, you can see that if you have more components, it goes to something like maybe strokes or parts of digits. If you take five components, it finds more or something that's more like prototypes. Right? It looks like a one, looks like a zero, looks like a nine. Um, 
And so you can also think of NMF as being um, related to uh, clustering in a sense because similar to, say, k-means, it tries to identify prototypes in the data. Only in NMF we allow arbitrary positive combinations, where in k-means we want to represent everything by exactly one prototype. So this is another reason why I think NMF is kind of interesting, because it kind of spans the range of, um, say, vector quantization is using k-means, where I try to represent every data point as a single cluster center, or a decomposition method like PCA, where um, basically I, um, I have components that are Com that are um, arbitrary, so I have negative and positive components, allow er I allow everything. Um, here I allow only positive components, and so I get something that is sort of intermediate. So you can think of k-means as being uh, something where you allow exactly one component to be one and all the others to be zero. That would be thinking of k-means as a decomposition method. So NF NMF has quite a few applications. Um, so we will talk a little bit about text analysis uh, next week. Um, often, so what all, many of these applications have in common is that you have very high dimensional data sets from which you want to extract some sort of semantic features. Uh, similar to what we did with the faces and PCA, here we, we have like some data set of signals and we want to get to this latent representation which we hope is either more discriminative or um, easier to understand. And so, as we'll see on Wednesday, text analysis, um, you often get very high dimensional data and so you can apply NMF to summarize this uh, general, uh, the general signal processing, uh, particular things like uh, speech and audio, there's nice applications of this with um, source separation. So um, in blind source separation, you have uh, audio that comes from, say, two different speakers or background noise in a speaker. And you can, uh, if you run NMF on that, people found that often you, each component will correspond to um, one of the two sources. So for each component, if you determine which of the two sources it is, you can separate the mixed signal of two sound sources into the original sources. Um, maybe you've seen like, uh, I, don't, I don't know if anyone here still remembers Winamp, but there was like a plugin to remove um, either the, back, the music or the vocals. That's sort of how this works. You get um, uh, this model of the speakers or the instruments uh, in, in W, and then once you know which component corresponds to which source, you can separate the sources. Similarly, you can think, do things in uh, gene expression analysis. Again, you have often very high dimensional and possibly sparse data, and so you want to express the, these gene expressions as possibly some linear combination of some prototypes. And so, in all of these, either you can think of NMSF as being used as um, feature extraction for a supervised task, or it's used as uh, exploratory data analysis, where um, similarly to like clustering or PCA, we try to find interesting structure in the data. I didn't actually show, show any code because it's just fit and transform, and I think you, you've seen that before. Um, so, but I think that's, that's all I want to say. So, if you, so, um, this is also interesting for like, if you have time series, so maybe we'll talk about this again when we come to time series at the end of the semester. Um, generally, if you have a data set that's positive 
just sort of think about, maybe it makes sense to run an MF on that, look at the results, if you can visualize them in some way, and think about whether this um, gives you any interesting insight. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I said it's a little bit hit or miss, but it's definitely something that's worth trying. And in uh, many areas, people have found this to be helpful. Questions? Everything completely clear? <laughs> people shake their heads. Great. Um, all right. Well, the next thing I wanted to talk about is a different task. It's also an unsupervised task um, called uh, outlier detection and possibly novelty detection, which are two related tasks. Again, this is sort of one of the like fundamental tasks in machine learning that people publish machine learning papers about. Um, similarly to clustering, there's sort of um, I mean, there's some areas where this is uh, quite useful, but it's not something you would apply to uh, whenever you get a data set. Um, some of the applications of outlier detection that I've seen is, for example, fraud detection, like uh, figuring out whether your credit card use was fraud or if you actually traveled somewhere. That was probably an outlier detection algorithm. Um, or I know Netflix used uh, one of the algorithms I'm going to talk about to figure out if um, the charges were fraud, uh, the credit tra card transaction was fraud or not. And so basically the goal is, given a whole bunch of data, figure out are some of them outliers, are some of them strange in some way. So there's two different settings, and I've said outlier detection, novelty detection. In outlier detection, usually the data set you start with um, is what people call contaminated. So let's say you have inliers, which I uh, drew in blue, and you have outliers, which I drew in orange. And so whatever training data you have has both inliers and outliers. And so you try to find a model of your data and it will allow you to figure out which ones are the outliers. Outlier detection, often you just want to do it on the data set you already have. So if someone hands you a data set and the question is, are there like outlier data points in there? But you can also apply this to, um, like, to a, a new data set. So imagine this is your training data set, this is your test data set, and then for a new test data set you want to say for each point, is this point an outlier or is this point an inlier? This is... Um, much more common the setting because usually whenever someone gives you data it's going to be dirty data and there's um, yeah, and it's very hard to know whether something like if you have a credit card history of someone there's no way to know whether there's a pro uh, where there's any uh, fraudulent transaction in there like you would have to go through every single one of them to check them and so um, here the point is to do this in an unsupervised way, so um, you try to automatically detect what the outliers are. In novelty detection, you assume that during the training time you have a data set that is clean, so that it's only in liars, and then at test time, when you get new data, for new data you, are, you have to um, predict whether the data is an inlier or an outlier. Um, in a sense, the task on the right seems a little bit easier than the task on the left. Uh, however, as with clustering, it's very hard to evaluate whether these algorithms work well, because um, this assumes you don't have ground truth. If you had ground truth, you might use a classification algorithm instead. Um, so very often you have to um, do some qualitative analysis, look at what is detected at outliers, and figure out are these actually outliers. There's also some settings where even though 
um, you have ground truth labels, outlier detection might be better suited than classification. For example, in um, let's say you work in manufacturing and you want to uh, figure out if something uh, was manufactured correctly by your machine or not. If you want to do classification, you basically need to have training examples for everything that could go wrong. So if you have a class, it's correct, and a class, it, it didn't go right. Um, to, to make a classifier, you need to have examples of every way it could go wrong. In outlier detection, you just assumed to have um, what it's supposed to be like. And um, so if something that goes wrong in a new way, you could potentially detect it. If you build a classifier and you have some points that are uh, like that you know are good and some points that you know were bad, um, but then something is bad in a different way, the classifier has no way to distinguish whether it's supposed to be good or bad. Unless all bad points share something in common, then it might be better to use supervised learning, which requires you to detect, uh, to label a data set. Um, okay, so yeah, I think I already mentioned um, a couple of applications, so credit card fraud, click fraud, so um, is there a bot that's clicking all the ads on the website? Uh, network failure detection, intrusion detection in network, um, defect detection in manufacturing and engineering, um, and people also like in user intelligence, um, monitoring what is happening, is something interesting happening, is something weird happening? Is there some kind of similar event? So the way this is uh, usually done is by, or often done, is by modeling the data distribution. So we already saw some data models like the Gaussian mixture model, or you can also take just one uh, Gaussian. And um, so you have something that defines what's the probability distribution that you expect over your data. And then if the data is sufficiently unlikely under your model, you say it is an outlier. This works in the novelty detection case. Because, so in a novelty detection case, um, you could use the clean data that you have to uh, fit the data distribution P of X, and then for a new data, you could say, is P of X small, uh, too small, then it's an outlier, or then it's a novelty. Um, for outlier detection, you already have these uh, have the outliers in your training data set. So um, if you fit the uh, model distribution P of X to this training data set, P of X will also be high for the outliers. So um, the idea here is to then use what is called a robust model for P of X. Robust in the sense of being robust to outliers. Um, an example that you're probably familiar with is um, the median. The median is basically a robust version of the mean because the median cannot be disturbed by some outliers. And so basically, uh, you want to find a model uh, P of X that is uh, robust to some outliers being present in the data. So you can fit P of X um, so that it only captures the inliers. Um, one very simple model for this uh, is called the elliptic envelope. This actually just fits um, a Gaussian model. So here, um, assume there's uh, a Gaussian envelope of inliers in black and some outliers in red. Um, so the outlier, so they come from two dis different Gaussian distributions. 
Uh, clearly, the outliers that are where data is, you would never, um, uh, they look like data, but there's also outliers that don't look like data out here. If um, you use um, a maximum likelihood estimate, which is just compute the covariance, use the empirical covariance, you get a Gaussian that is um, the blue lines, and you can see the blue lines are sort of much more round than what you would expect from the inliers because it captures, excuse me, both the inliers and the outliers. Um, in uh, the red, dot, red and yellow dotted lines, you can see a robust estimate. So um, I'm not going to go into the details. This is implemented in the uh, elliptic envelope in scikit-learn, but this basically uses um, a shrinkage method uh, to um, basically yeah, ig ignore the, the tails of the data in a sense so that um, it will ignore the outliers when fitting um, the model. So basically it fits the model and then figures out which points are unlikely under the model and then it, it kind of ignores those. And you can see the um, robust distribution basically just captures the outliers, uh, just captures the inliers. And so that's a much more realistic model of the data and this will be much better able to detect the outliers. Um, very brief example with scikit-learn here. Um, so Elliptic envelopes in the covariance module. Um, you have to specify in scikit-learn for most of the algorithms you have to, uh, contamination. The contamination is what you expect um, the fraction of outliers to be. If you fit any probabilistic model, you want to know where should, do I need to specify my cutoff, um, which points should I consider outliers. And that's the contamination. So basically here I'm saying, uh, assume that 10% of the data are contaminated. And fit to the remaining 90% that you can model best. And um, outlier detection methods in scikit-learn all have a predict method. And you can see the prediction uh, is either one or minus one. Minus one are the outliers. And you can see that uh, in a prediction, about 10% of the prediction are minus one, which is uh, what I asked for. I asked for a model that basically flags 10% of the data as outliers. Um, you might remember the minus one was used in a similar way in DB scan. So DB scan also tags outliers as uh, minus one. <coughs> All right, so now we have this uh, elliptic uh, envelope that has a very obvious failure case, which is non-Gaussian data. So if your data cannot be modeled well by a Gaussian, so here the assumption is that uh, these three points are the outliers and uh, these guys and these guys are the inliers. If I fit elliptic envelope, it'll um, declare these guys out here as an outlier, which is not what I want. So there are several other models I can use that are sort of more flexible in how they model the data. Um, one that we already saw uh, last time was uh, Gaussian mixture models. I'm not going to go through this again. I mean, Gaussian mixture models are not robust, so they will also capture the outliers. It might be a bit of a problem, but you could, in principle, uh, use Gaussian mixture models. You could also go a little bit more extreme and use um, what's called uh, kernel density. So the idea in kernel density is basically to compute something like a histogram, but a soft histogram. Um, so let's say you have a um, point here, here, here. So this is like some points on 1D, and you can compute either um, 
and this is a histogram, which is actually a kernel density estimate uh, with like a top hat kernel, um, where you just count how many points are in each bin, or instead you can place a Gaussian for each data point and then sum up all the contributions over all the data points. So if I have these six points here, I place uh, some Gaussian mass on each data point and um, then I get this sort of smooth distribution. Uh, slight caveat here, this word kernel is a different kernel than in support vector machines, even though in this example I used um, a Gaussian function, which is a very common kernel of use. This kernel here is in the sense of signal processing, where kernels are things that smooth the data, like in a convolution, and they are different from the uh, reproducing of uh, Hilbert kernels, space, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces kernels. And so, don't confuse the two kinds of kernels there are. Um, and it's usually you can tell from context which one is meant. So here this is about using a, a function to smooth over the data. And you can think of this as a convolution if you're familiar with convolutions. Um, the problem with this is that uh, you have to specify a kernel bandwidth and because this is an unsupervised uh, problem, it's kind of hard to uh, hard to pick that. Um, there's some you can try to cross validate it, and sometimes that works, but not always. So if you pick your kernel uh, bandwidth too small, you get something like the red line, which is very wiggly. If you pick it too uh, large, you get something that's way too smooth, like the green line. So here the gray line was the actual original data, which was Gaussian, and the black line is like a reasonable kernel density estimate. Um, here's an example of how this would solve the problem that we had with um, using uh, a big envelope on non-Gaussian data. So here I pick the bandwidth, um, let's say by looking at the data or by some uh, magical process. Um, I said sometimes you can actually do it with cross-validation. Um, KDE actually doesn't have the uh, outlier detection interface in scikit-learn, so um, you have to call uh, score samples, but score samples basically gives you the probability distribution function and then it say um, uh, score the 10th percentile. So this gives me the in layers and outliers. And you can see here in the colors, these are the, um, uh, the, the levels of the kernel density estimate. And basically everything that is in light uh, green here or in blue is uh, marked as outliers. I said to uh, flag 10% of the data as outliers, so not only uh, these three outliers that I want to find are flagged, but also everything else that's sort of as far away from the other data as you can get. So the two main issues with these kernel density estimates is that A, you have to pick the kernel bandwidth, and uh, B, these don't scale very well. This is a typical example of something that um, suffers from the curse of dimensionality. If you want to spend a high dimensional space, the kernel's uh, density, like the, let's say the, the, the block of probability that you have around each data point falls off very quickly in all directions, and so you have to have a lot of data everywhere um, to make this work in higher dimensions. Um, you can get a slight improvement over this by um, using one-class SVMs. These um, 
us or use Gaussian kernels to cover the data. Only here, the intuition behind the Gaussian kernels is not probability distributions, but um, but uh, inner products. So these are the other kind of kernels, even though both have the same formula. Um, the reason why this scale, uh, might scale a little bit better is because um, it selects only uh, certain support vectors that um, basically the algorithm um, finds are like good support of the probability distribution. And again, you have the problem of finding the uh, right kernel bandwidth. Um, there's also another uh, parameter uh, which is called new. New here is basically the same as um, the contamination we had earlier. It is the fraction of um, training points we assume to be outliers. This is the same uh, toy example. Um, so it, but now they didn't find this guy is outlier, but this is mostly a matter of how did I tune my gamma, and so um, I didn't really find a good way to tune gamma for um, or the kernel bandwidth for this, um, and so I guessed one, and I, I guess I didn't guess it very well. Uh, clearly, I mean, you can see this is a problem in higher dimensional spaces. I would not be able to visualize this in any meaningful way, and so picking the right kernel bandwidth would would be even higher in higher dimensional spaces. All right. So now to my favorite outlier detection algorithm, which is uh, isolation forests. Um, you might have figured a theme in this class is I like everything that is based on trees because they, they just work much better. Though there's uh, a bunch of magic in this algorithm as well. The reason why it is my favorite is there's no parameters to tune, or um, in other words, the, the authors of the original paper give us magic parameters that always work, which is great. But they actually always work, so it doesn't matter. Um, so the idea is that we build trees uh, that are completely random and try to separate, uh, or it, just they completely randomly partition the data. And so um, here's an example. Let's say you drew like um, a split here, and then here, and then here, and then here, and so on. And um, the, the splits, you draw them between um, the com over the complete range of the data set. So, for you would normally draw splits. And now, you ask, how deep do I need to go in the tree until I isolated a particular data point from all the other data points? So, you can think of this like how, yeah. like if you think of every data point as a single class, how deep do I have to deep do my, uh, create a pure leaf for a given data point? And if something is somewhere in the middle of the data, you have to go very deep to cut it off from all the data points around it, like random, by randomly drawing splits. But if something is on the very edge of the data, then it's very likely that just by chance, whatever you draw will separate it pretty well from the rest. And that's sort of the, the main intuition. So you create these trees at random, and you check how deep do I have to go to separate a particular point from all the other points. There's like a lot of randomness involved in building these trees. So um, we do our standard thing and build a uh, a forest instead of building a single tree. So here's a plot from the original paper, I think. If you um, add more and more trees, this will get pretty stable, and you can get sort of a stable score. The score is the mean depth 
um, or average path lengths um, in the tree until you get to this point. And you can see that here it stabilizes around like 13 for the inliner and around like 4 uh, for the outlier. And so here there's not really an explicit probabilistic model behind. This is more, I mean, you can probably come up with some way to uh, de define probabilistically what's going on here, but um, I don't think that was the original motivation. So, um, in the original paper, what um, they say is, well, they, they um, want to say, is a point an outlier or not? And so, uh, not given the, so they basically want to get rid of the last parameter, which is the contamination fraction, and they say, well, how deep do you need to be to be an outlier? And uh, they relate this to the average path length of an unsuccessful search in a binary tree. And you can compute this. Um, it's this guy. This is just sort of from algorithm literature. Um, and from this, they compute uh, this number which is, so, um, h of x is the d depth in the tree. This is the expectation over all the trees in the forest, or like infinitely many trees if you want to, um, like a theory. And uh, this is the average path length of an unfocused search in a binary search tree for n data points. Um, and that's a sort of normalization. And um, then they say, well, if the score is close to 0.5, it's an inlier, it's close to 1, it's an outlier. And the goal here was to kind of make, make these numbers independent of the number of samples. Uh, because if you have more samples, you would need deeper trees. And here, basically, by taking this expectation, they find a reasonable way to normalize um, the depth, like how does depth, how is depth supposed to grow with a number of samples, and they try to normalize this away here. All right, so how are we going to build um, forests? So we subsample data set for each tree. Um, the default they say in the paper is well build each tree on. 256 data points, and um, that's what people always use in practice, and it seems to work reasonably well, so that's fine. Um, and you start growing trees at um, log 2 of sample size, which is always 8 if your sample size is always 256. Um, as usual with these ensembles, more trees are better. Usually, if you use 100, it's enough. If you want to make sure, you use 1,000. And there's no bootstrapping, so you, you do sampling without replacement of uh, 256 points at a time. So the subsampling makes it um, aim much faster and also makes sure the trees are quite diverse because you build them on small subsets of the data, usually. And um, so you, you have this normalized score S, but um, if you actually want to threshold it, well, you, you can either go with the authors and say, if it's close to one, it's an outlier, but, or you can specify what close to one is, and then you can specify a contamination rate. So yeah, in principle, you could tune all of these, but people don't tend to do that that much. Is there anything that we can do if we have no idea what the contamination rate would be in a given Oh, so the question is, what, what do we do if we don't have any idea what the contamination rate is? So the beautiful thing here is um, the fitting of the model is independent of the contamination rate. In the other models, often the fitting of the model depended on your assumption of the data. Here, you just always fit the model, you get the score. And um, so the contamination rate is only used to threshold the score at the end. 
what you can do is you can look at the data point that is flagged as the most outlier by your algorithm, you look at that, and then the next one, and so on. If they all look terrible, then you look at like way more in with the scores, and so you can, I mean, in the end, you, this always uh, ends in doing some uh, qualitative analysis and looking at what the new data points mean. But you get this ranking, and this ranking is independent of what your assumption is on the contamination rate. So that's, that's also actually quite nice. Um, that is, the contamination rate only influences the cutoff, not the model. Um, the question is, uh, if I don't bootstrap, that samples uh, that limits the number of trees. Um, I guess that's theoretically true, but not practically. Like, uh, I mean, you have n samples over two fifty-six, and that's like infinity for and samples greater than 500. And there's the number of combinations that you can draw uh, from 256. So, I mean, that's like the binomial and samples faculty divided by samples minus 256. And it's like, then grows very quickly. Again, it grows exponentially with sample size. So uh, there's going to be many of them. Cool. So this is the predictions done by the um, on my toy data set. I mean, as always, obviously, the caveat is don't like don't interpret too much in two-dimensional data sets because they behave very differently from real data sets. But I can show them, so I show them. Um, so here I didn't have to specify anything, and um, well, here I specified the contamination rate to get uh, rate to get uh, these ten points as outliers, but I didn't really have to specify uh, the model or anything like that. And if I look at the scores, you can see that actually. Um, this point and this point are like the most outliery, and uh, well, there's a couple of points that are as outliery as this one, I guess. Um, so here, trees usually look very ragged. Um, I think some of the the kinks you can see here are also from like artifacts from how I generated the plot, but generally trees have not like super smooth. Um, uh, surfaces because we randomly draw thresholds, so it's going to be very noisy. Um, there was a, a conference where there was like an um, outlier detection challenge on finding, I think it was like MasterCard or something, asking for um, predicting outliers, like predicting credit card fraud. And um, I was kind of trolling because that's what I usually do. And so I just took the data set, ran mean imputation and centered scaling. No, not even scaling. I ran mean imputation, one hot encoding, and then this model. And then I did it second place without doing anything. Um, maybe there was only one other person in the competition. I don't know. But uh, to me, that means that it actually uh, works uh, reasonably well. But um, yeah, I mean, some some other density-based models. Um, we talked about uh, PCA and GMMs. The caveat there is they are not uh, robust. So that means if your data is already uh, contaminated, which it usually is, uh, it will influence the fit of the model. It might not be useless, but it might be biased. There is an algorithm called uh, robust PCA which is not in scikit-learn, but you can find many Python implementations um, if you're looking for it. This is, as the name says, a robust version of PCA, so this will uh, find principal components and disregard the outliers. This is actually what Netflix used for their fraudulent transactions, like 
four years ago or something. But um, yeah, so that seemed to work, uh, work pretty well for them. And in general, you can use any probabilistic model. Though, if you have contamination in your training data, ideally you would use a robust model so that the outliers don't, um, well, don't contaminate your model too much. Here, this is an example just from the uh, second long website where you can see a couple of the uh, models. So here this shows one class SVM, robust covariance and isolation forest. By now there's actually, I think there's at least one more uh, model in scikit-learn called local outlier factor. Um, I find it very hard to compare these models because in, uh, they are unsupervised. And so there's really not, not a good way to evaluate them. I mean, you can create synthetic data where you know what the outliers are, but then it's synthetic data. Um, yeah, so you can see that if you have just a single Gaussian blob, well, if, if you have Gaussian data, then the Gaussian models does uh, perfect, which is not too surprising. If you ha have something that is less Gaussian, um, the robust covariance, will uh, at some point kind of break. So you can see here, it'll think these points are inliers and the points that are actually inliers are outliers. Um, one class SVM does uh, better, but it's kind of tricky to uh, tune, the comp tune the parameters. So I'm not sure actually if, how the parameters were tuned in the example. I think it's probably just um, a square root of number of features, one over square root of number of features. Um, yeah, and the isolation for us, you don't have to tune anything, and it actually works quite well uh, many times. Looks like I want to be early again today. I promise you, Wednesday I will not be early, I will be very late. Um, so, I mean, I think isolation for us work pretty well. If if you know, or if you have a reasonable model of your data that you know or think is correct, this density model will also uh, work pretty well. Um, yeah, estimating anything that has a bandwidth, estimating the bandwidth is uh, tricky. And in the end, um, usually you need manual verification of the results, whatever you do. Um, this is the common to most unsupervised methods that you need to look at it and see does it make sense or not. Um, possibly uh, pick a different algorithm, pick a different bandwidth, um, and so on. The reason, okay, so I said in most like day-to-day -day machine learning, you might probably not do that. Um, so this is really where you're looking for outliers. Some people um, talk about outlier detection like you would do this whenever you get a data set and look at what are the outliers before I build my machine learning model. And I've, I've seen that happen very rarely. The reason is that detecting outliers is pretty hard. And so it's usually not a good idea to like, make your life harder by trying to detect outliers and then ignore them but just try build a machine learning model that's robust to outliers if you actually in like a supervised task. So I would only go through these algorithms if really what you're looking for is finding the outliers. Yeah. Sometimes that can be helpful if you do exploratory data analysis, but if you just wanna do, if you just wanna build a classification or regression model, I would just build a classification or regression model and not worry about the outliers too much, at least in the first 10 iterations. All right, that's it for today, and um, on Wednesday we'll start with talking about text data. <laughs>